Hi, welcome back, everyone. Um, this is a time where we have a, a content discussion with our speaker. Uh, but first of all, let me thank you all for your time today and your generosity. It's so much like, first, it's a lot of fun, but we've learned so much with having you here today, the three of you, and, and having a lot of different perspective on, on the security team topic. I think one of the common uh, theme throughout your different talks is like, how do we make sure we recognize the work um, of our security teams throughout metrics? And how do we foster a healthy culture and a safe culture as well around for, for our, our folks, for our best assets, which is our, our teams? Um, so how we will work today, we have a lot of great questions in the, the Slido chat. Uh, since we do have a little bit of lag, uh, I'll try to uh, uh, redirect the question uh, back to back to each one of you. So it's a little bit easier uh, for you guys as well to, to answer me. Uh, so before we start any comments or anything you would like to add, because uh, I don't know, I'm just asking. I really liked Chloe's talk. I like Tanya's talk. <laughs> it was nice to finally get to see it because like it's it's brand new, but it's like, yeah, I thank you. It's good. Also, people all last night were texting me to tell me, North Sex so awesome. And I was like, I know. <laughs> Well, that's really cool to hear. Thank you. I think like uh, both, but not both, but the three of you were having different talks than what we usually have at NordSec. And I think it's refreshing, especially in these days where um, we feel a lot of pressure uh, to be on, on top of everything and to excel and to be perfect. So, so yeah. That's it. That was really great. Thank you all so much for that. Um, so let's start with a few questions on the Slido board, if, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, is the InfoSec industry particularly bad at dealing with mental health and burnout? So I will put my question first uh, to Ange. Uh, if that's okay with you, because you mentioned a lot, uh, burnout was also one of your team uh, throughout your presentation. So I'm curious to see uh, what you, what your thoughts on on the industry. Uh, I personally think that uh, infosec is very young as a topic, as a as a domain, and there is a lot of arrogance and novelty and whatever, and still a lot of misunderstanding, which uh, increased the will of showing off, which means uh, mental health and burnout are like losers. And therefore only it's like a still a very immature uh, industry and world. And uh, because it's still possible to, to break so much, it's still so new as a topic. So uh, I, I, you don't need to you don't need, uh, I don't know, I, it, it's worth comparison probably, but if you're a trained driver, it's been an established job for a long time. And uh, the, 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 the damages it caused to the users, to the, to the people doing it, uh, is long documented enough, you know, and uh, it's still new, too new. So that's why it's the youth, uh, pro the problem of youth, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I shuffled the card a little bit. Uh, everyone was expecting my question to be directed to Chloe, but I wanted to spice it up a little bit. But uh, Chloe, <laughs> any thought on it? Yeah, I would say that burnout is definitely prevalent in our industry. I think you can find burnout in almost any industry when you're expected to do a lot more than you can give and when you don't have boundaries. So for example, I think of all the frontline work health workers right now. They're around the clock and it's extremely emotionally tolling to see so much death happen before you're on here. So that's not why you went into in the healthcare in the first place, right? You went in it to help people, to have them have a healthier long life. And then seeing that, that's intense. So I think all industries you'll find burnout, it 
it's whenever when we are overextending ourselves and when we're putting too much on one another, but also the demand is not taking in the factor that mental health is part of this. Like we cannot keep separating mental health from physical health. It's, it's one of the same. You will have, if you have anxiety or depression, you're going to have pains. If you have anxiety and depression, you're going to feel pains. Like it, it doesn't, it's, it's part of health. And so we need to start recognizing that. And I think that from the pandemic itself, companies are becoming more uh, open about that conversation and trying to figure out how do we do better? Because they're realizing that they've over demanded from their employees quite a bit. Absolutely. And Tanya, yeah, of course, do you have a, do you want to pitch in a little bit on this one? Yeah. Um, so computer science is one of the youngest of the science, but then on top of that, cybersecurity within it is even younger. And then the area that I specialize in application security is, is yet even younger. It's around 20 years old. And I feel like with some other industries, They have well-established processes of how they do things, but we don't. Um, so when I go in and talk to companies, everyone has a different way they're trying to make their software secure. They have different expectations and what they want, et cetera, of, of how to do things. And so I feel like part of the stress and burnout is also because one, we keep failing. So it's, it's really distressing to work somewhere, work your butt off, try really hard, and you You know, you don't have the exact guidance of what to do. So when you are an engineer and you learn how to architect a house and build a house and you go and buy like a two by four, a two by four is an exact measurement every time. But when we go to build software or build networks, these things are changing out from under us constantly. And then the expectation is that we're somehow going to be aware of all these changes and make sure that I perfectly protect all of them every time. I think that's part of the problem. And part of the other problem is that There is no exact clear way to do the thing so that you can know you're doing the best work, right? And so again, an engineer knows, I check these things. I do a really good job of these things. I should be good. We don't have that. And I think that that's part of, of the thing that can lead to, you know, people doing some of the things Chloe and Anj talked about, like working past the hours they're supposed to. If they knew I have to do these seven things, once you've kicked the crap out of those seven things, it's like, I'm going home and I'm relaxing, but we don't, it's not clear for us in information security the way it is in many other industries. So I hope that helps. It did, it did, absolutely. Um, and this is maybe more a, a very large question, but is there any way we can leverage metrics to use them internally in the security teams in a way to measure healthy, of course, there's surveyed or stuff like that, but do you have any experience or have you seen this implemented in, in real life teams where metrics can really help avoid burnout and, and situation like that? Yes, Tanya, go for it. You're on mute. Okay, yeah, it's on mute. Um, so uh, when I worked at Elections Canada, so that was an example I gave um, in the talk where Basically, like when you work on an election in Canada, there's 36 days. They do something, they drop the writ all the way up to the day where the election happens. And they, so one thing they do is they prepare way in advance. So they run an entire pretend election six months before and they throw security incidents in, they throw hackers, they like just make it the worst it could be. And then we try to iron out things so that everything can be better. They try to have every single thing ready for the day that writ is dropped for years in advance. And then when the election is happening, they're well aware of things. So for instance, like I was leading a team, I went and I bought like all of these like protein bars and chocolate, like banana, peanut bar, whatever. And I remember like before the election started, I'm like, listen, all these are in my drawer. Sometimes it's hard to get people to deliver stuff in the middle of the night. We don't know when we're going to be here. And they're like, yes, mom. <laughs> But then guess what happened? <laughs> They'd be coming to my desk. Do you have any of those peanut butter ones left? I'm like, yeah, peanut butter. Or we've got like, I can't remember, almond. And they're like, thanks, mom. <laughs> um, and like preparing for the fact that we know that there's going to be long hours, making sure that there's food available, making sure there's food that each different person can eat because I'm um, like, I have like all these food sensitivities. So like I can't have gluten and other things that are so easy to have. 
Um, and so we like they plan way in advance. And then also after the resting their staff thing is really important. So if you work at a place, so since then, whenever I've worked at a place, if there are lots of security incidents happen, I measure the rest points between incidents because you you can burn out your staff really easy with security incidents, especially if that's not their full-time job. So AppSec people specifically, if there's a vulnerability in a software and it's been breached or it's been attacked or whatever, immediately they're like, put down your job and all your projects, all your operational things that you support and go run off with this for a few weeks. Everyone's still like, Tanya, are you coming to this meeting? I'm like, no. Tanya, are you still get No. And so setting that expectation that you can put your work down and that like your project timelines will be extended, I think that could help too. Does anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, I would say also on the, all of that. And I definitely feel you on the food thing because I also have <laughs> dietary restrictions. So when I'm traveling or going anywhere or like going in the office, I'm always worried that I'm not going to have food because I can't like order pizza. If people are going to order pizza, I'm not going to be able to eat it. Um, but I would say another thing that one can do is that you know, during those one-on-ones, I mentioned that 15 minute one-on-ones have like, you could use Evernote, for example, but having somewhere, a place where you have a shared doc with your, um, your manager. So they see what you're working on. So then they don't have to keep tapping your shoulder. Um, I would say that's definitely one of the metrics is seeing if they're hitting their projects, um, making sure they're completed. I, I don't care what like what hours you work, as long as you get your work done. And I think that's kind of like the thing that we have to get more flexible about, especially if we're trying to have more diversity, equity, inclusion, we need to start incorporating that more because that flexibility of no, like of what hours work best for you is actually a way better process. I think for a lot of people, um, it helps with the flexibility. So you're able to reduce that burnout too, as well. So I would say the metrics would be like, making sure you're hitting your projects on time and, and making sure that you're on the same page. So any type of metrics that you can find in, in your organization or the way you function, that's going to be really useful. Super. Thanks for that. Franch, would you like to uh, add anything on this question? So I, uh, I definitely think that uh, the uh, managing the way Chloe mentioned is a good thing, but uh, because I felt two kinds of uh, burnout uh, myself, uh, the ones that where you are worried about uh, the what the ones where you are yeah so yeah the ones where you just want to to do your project better, and but also the ones where you you should be told not to do anything extra, and uh, at least. My my previous manager, uh, because well, I mean I just changed manager, so let's give. It. <laughs> no, no, it's just uh, it's, it's, no, it, um, I was saying that if there is a meeting that is late or anything, just don't go uh, because preserve yourself and uh, don't. Uh, uh, it it was weird, like don't participate in stuff, whatever. It was not like out of jealousy or anything, but it's definitely it's technically something that happened to me that in a big company, when you have someone interesting, uh, awake and ready to, to discuss about interesting stuff at any time, uh, I burned myself out initially very quickly after a couple of weeks, just because, you know, you could just be at 2 a.m. talking with someone about something super interesting. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, like uh, when you have these uh, rats and you, they, if they press a bar, they give cocaine, they get cocaine directly or something. And uh, I just, and it's it's weird because it's not the usual burnout, but it was definitely a risk. And uh, the legend that uh, you get uh, 10 kilo at Google after a month. Now it's more like after a week or something in my case. <laughs> so that would be a metric, right? <laughs> uh, well, no. To be honest, no, no manager told me not to eat too much, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I realized I was moving slower. Uh, I, I Still, I'm French, so take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Absolutely. <kilo> of salt. <laughs> that, uh, that's very interesting. Um, there's another question that's kind of related to what we talked about is, as a manager, um, do you have any concrete ways that managers and mentors uh, can help 
either battle their direct reports or the people around them uh, either burnout, but also imposter syndrome uh, that we also talked about. Any tips and tricks about that? Uh, I will, yeah, go Chloe. <laughs> I would say a, the best leader wants someone to succeed beyond them. And one of the things is being transparent. In a sense, like, I think when when leaders keep pretending that everything's okay with them, like, that they're able to keep doing everything with a smile, I think it's really bad because you're also, it's harder for people to connect with you. And I think one of the things we have to see ourselves is, like, as a manager, it's not being just a leader. It's also being there for your team, being part of that team. So that means like, I like to do more of a round table way of looking at things in a sense where I have everyone around the table, no matter what their title is, we're all talking frankly with each other. And I think that's one of the things, how to be a good manager is to be okay with being transparent. Also to want to lead your team in a sense where you're not telling them what to do. Instead, you're coming together to come up with solutions. I think that is one thing for sure. Very interesting. Um, so more like a coaching and also being more vulnerable with your team can also make it more easy for them to talk to you and vice versa. That's yeah. what... Okay, That's, cool. Yeah, I think it's one of those things because we never really, I think in the past year, we personal with each other. So it used to be like, hey, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing okay. That's usually how our response has been. But now I don't know, like even with a stranger, you'll be on a, you know, Zoom first time you meet them and you're like, hi, it's nice to meet you. How are you doing? Well, this is what's going on. My daughter has COVID-19. I'm stuck at home now for 14 days and I'm overwhelmed because my partner has asthma. Like you could just, and it's, it's just complete stranger. But the reality is it changed the circumstances because suddenly you realize, oh, we're equals here. We got, we have issues and it's okay for us to be real with each other. And I think that's the thing is like, no one wants to do small talk anymore. People want to be real with each other now. I agree, and I will pass the baton to Tanya, but one last thing is that now we see the homes of everyone, right? So you already feel that connection with someone because you see their dog, you see their kids, uh, you see the environment that they are in. So that creates also a bond. That's at least my, my feeling about what the situation that we have today. Tanya, I see, I'm sure you have a lot to, to add on top of this. <laughs> Um, so at my company, I'm the CEO, so I'm sort of the boss of everyone, and we hold 360 reviews. And so we have um, sessions, we call them feedback loops, and it's where they give me feedback and I give them feedback. And I try to be extremely explicit, so or extremely specific. So for instance, you know, you wrote this newsletter and it was excellent. And it's excellent because like you followed the format perfectly, the images you chose were great. You remembered, you know, all the links were linked correctly. Your grammar was awesome. And like, I remember we talked about this before and like now you fixed that and I'm just like, and you know, you finished it on time. You gave me lots of time to review it. Like, I want you to know you did a really great job this week. And if there is a problem, so for instance, like, let's pretend it's the, the newsletter. It's like, okay, so this link was broken um, and, you know, we sent it out and then people complained. So how can we fix that uh, in the future? And so then we developed a QA process. We also always do a, do you have enough work? Do you have too much work? If you have too much work, then like we reprioritize and like drop things. Like often we drop things. And also, um, so we're a startup, right? There's only five of us right now. So I do a lot of, where do you want your career to go? And then I make sure I assign them specific things on that. So like we have one student and she's really interested in finance. And so we're gonna do a bunch of financial forecasting together rather than me doing it solo so she can have that experience. And the other one is really interested in HR. So I'm like, you know what? I've been meaning to create policies around this, this, and this. Will you create all of them with me? And she's like, yes. And so then we can motivate them, right? Because they're getting experience they want we're building them up to be the best people that they can be. And if I'm lucky, I'll be able to retain them and hire them when they graduate, right? And, but I also receive feedback from them. Like I, you, I haven't had enough time with you, you know, or your explanation was good, but then I forgot these details. So we've started things where sometimes when we give training, I'm like, do you want me to record this so that you have a copy? Like, oh yeah, that would be great, right? And so we've, 
by asking all the time for feedback. So at first they're always like, nothing, everything's great. But then after a while they're like, well, actually, I'd really like this, or I'd really like that. And so sometimes, like for some, some of them, we have like an everyday stand up. And other ones, they're like, I really like it when you just give me a big chunk of work and I just go through it for X number of days till I'm done. And so like figuring out which way each person needs to, to work. And so like having, you know, regular sessions where you give them constructive feedback and that's good and bad. And sometimes it's, it's not even that bad, but I find a lot of managers, they're never specific. Like I'll have managers say, you're really awesome. Like That doesn't help me. That doesn't make me better. Like, who are you, my mom? My mom needs to tell me I'm awesome. I need you to tell me you're really good at this. You're so strong at that. I would love to see more of this, right? And I feel like a lot of managers are worried um, that like the employees will you know, react badly. But if you're sensitive in the way that you deliver the feedback, I find that it can go really, 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 really well. Um, so those are my thoughts. And I also, in the past, when I've had bosses, I do 360 reviews, whether they want to or not. I'm like, I'm going to give you feedback. They're like, what? I'm like, sit down. <laughs> like, I need more of this from you. I would like more of that. You know, I see this happening. How can both of us be better? Or like, I feel I'm failing at this. I need this from you so I can do more. And like, I, I don't know. I've never been worried I'm going to get fired. I've never been fired. I'm like that jackass employee that like does most of the work. So everyone, you know, like, you know, you have that confidence. You're like, yeah, but if I leave, everything will break. So it's fine. But like, I, I want every employee to feel safe that they can say like, I don't have the reason. Like one of our questions in the 60 review is, do you have everything you need to do your job the best you could do it? And sometimes they're like, well, actually, it'd be really cool if this. I'm like, done. And sometimes it's like the littlest thing that makes a huge, huge difference for your employee. So I guess like listening and asking the right questions and building trust so they feel they can actually tell you the truth. Absolutely. You're building this relationship and you're motivating, motivating them while like learning and growing your business as well. And all of these tips and tricks, we can apply them to larger organization um, for sure. Ange, any, um, and maybe more on the imposter syndrome, any thoughts on how we can make or help our, our team battle them to empower them to be uh, what they really want to be, those persons? It just, uh, I think it just goes to the essence of that, of fighting that is just showing that everyone ha has it in their own way. Uh, we actually have a, I'm not sure how confidential it is. At Google, we have a imposter syndrome chain where you can say, hey, this colleague is giving me imposter syndrome. And it's, you know, and you can see, it's only it feels like, oh, I'm giving imposter syndrome to that person, I, you know, the, the, for no reason. And then that shows that it's pretty commonplace. And also uh, had a uh, extremely, uh, so some of my even extremely brilliant colleagues sometimes some of them just acknowledge like a child i have no idea or sorry i'm just a beginner and it's like wait what <laughs> wait what uh it was sometimes even almost too much of humility but definitely it was showing that it was just widespread and everywhere and uh no matter the the experience or the actual experience somewhere and uh and in the end it's still easy to, I mean, no one in the security teams, uh, at least at Google, uh, is just pretending they know everything or a lot or anything because that you would be just, in, maybe, you know, it doesn't work, you know, <laughs> That's what, you, you see what I mean? Uh, we are enough and uh, uh, so, so that's, I just think there's not such a process, but on the other hand, in previous uh, jobs I had, previous employers I had before, when they ask employees to rate themselves, some some of them, uh, so basically I, I think it was you rate yourself from one to five, five being the best, and I said no one on earth can have the five because it was like you have a complete knowledge of all file formats or something. It's like no one has that ever. And some people rated themselves five straight away. and. I don't sure it's a part of the culture of the company in this case, but if you don't have someone super experienced who just says, hey, 
I'm level three or something. You see what I mean? If no one, the one that is kind of acknowledges with the most experience has shows no humility, then they show the bad direction for everything, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I think as well, it's circling back to something that was in your press, uh, Angers. See, it's, it's regarding failing, not being scared of failing. I think it's also goes back to uh, imposter syndromes and burnout because you, you feel like you're failing. Do you guys have any aspirational or any good, not good, but stories that you can share to maybe empower the people that are listening here today? Uh, I'll start with uh, Tanya. If you feel insecure about something, go learn it. If anyone makes me feel like I don't know a thing or makes me feel bad, first of all, I often think it's, it's, they are saying that about themselves. Like whenever I've had anyone really lash out at me, it's 99.9%. It's, it's something that they feel about themselves. So think about that if someone lashes out at you. And then the other thing is if I feel uncomfortable about something, I just go and look. I look it up, I learn about it, and then I'm like, next time that comes up, oh yeah, I know everything about it. And I just feel strong, I feel better, and I feel proud of myself. I try to, if I feel insecure, improve myself so I don't feel insecure. I see a lot of people where they take it out on other people or they take it out on themselves. And like, that's not a win for anyone, especially for you. So I would suggest improve yourself so you don't feel insecure if possible. Thanks for that, Chloe. Th this will be our last question. So Chloe, if you have any thoughts or anything yeah, else to add. I think Tanya nailed it. Um, I'm going to be honest. Anytime I don't know something, I learn it because I know that if I don't know something and I need to provide an answer, I need to learn anything I can about it and ask people to. Um, I think the one thing is that admitting that you don't know something is okay too. Um, but I think that's one of the things is like, we're always trying to be perfect sometimes. And I think that can be extremely exhausting um, and it's okay not to be perfect. Um, but I would say the one thing that I have learned is that there will always be people out there that don't want to see you succeed too. And I think that's the hardest part that I've dealt with in my work, like career experience is there will be people that don't want you to succeed. Um, there will be people that don't want to see you go up because it makes them feel uncomfortable about themselves. And I have to admit, if you're around people like that, surround yourself with people that support you and want to see you thrive and are applauding for you when you're, you're doing all incredible work, because there will always be people that they don't want change and they don't want to see change happen because it scares them. Absolutely. That's, that's sad, but it's kind of true. Um, Alls, any last thought uh, that you want to share with us regarding um, failures? Maybe well, not, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fail at providing a good answer. <laughs> no, you see, there too much you to go. Say. I gave a whole talk about that too uh, before, so <laughs> no, that's okay. Absolutely. Well, I would like to thank you all again for being here today, uh, for being part of this community. It was very, very interesting. Um, so that's all I can say. Thank you for your time. And hopefully everyone who watched it enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you all next year. <laughs> yes. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anja and Chloe, for your amazing comments, too, you all. Well, likewise, everyone. Thank you, and take care. Yes.